Uh, I want to wish you all a good morning uh, and heartfelt gratitude for participating in today's roundtable. Uh, I've always said that representation begins with listening, and I'm here to do so. I'm going to speak very little uh, and open my ears and want to hear from all of you uh, about the challenges that you're facing, uh, the new Competes Act uh, that we will be considering this week in Congress, uh, and how we can improve the supply chain challenges that are of course, affecting all of you and your businesses, uh, our entire country and the world. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I hope you will share your unvarnished perspectives and opinions, uh, elements of the package that you like, uh, ones that you think require some further consideration, uh, because I will bring your feedback uh, to my colleagues in Congress uh, and look forward to a, a thoughtful discussion uh, today. So I'm going to go around um, each of you. I'd like to just simply ask you to introduce yourselves, uh, share a little about your business and your organization, and uh, a brief analysis, if you will, uh, of the Competes Act, uh, its potential impact on your businesses, on the semiconductor industry, uh, and supply chains generally. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Mark Doherty, a president and GM of Tell Manufacturing, and Engineering of America. Welcome, Mark. And if you might take three to five minutes uh, to introduce yourself a little about your business and perspectives on the Compete Act, I'd be grateful. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Congressman, and good morning to you and uh, everyone else. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, so uh, as uh, was mentioned, I'm, I'm Mark Doherty. I lead what is uh, Tokyo Electron's U.S. factory, which is uh, based in Chaska, Minnesota. And uh, so we're part of the broader uh, global network uh, of Tokyo Electron and are very proud to be able to manufacture capital uh, processing equipment for the semiconductor industry uh, here in Minnesota. Um, we're a growing business like I know, you know, everyone that's represented here, uh, given the just dynamic growth that's occurring uh, in our segment. And, um, you know, we're glad to be able to participate in that. Uh, Congressman, as you mentioned, certainly there are a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities that, that come along with that um, as we seek to continue to grow together um, and uh, to further expand uh, really from an economic standpoint for everyone's benefit. Um, Congressman, as you know, um, TEL uh, certainly supports uh, the, uh, the act and the proposal uh, and what that could mean for developing um, the end-to-end -end supply chain uh, of all really all aspects of the semiconductor industry, ranging from uh, materials, certainly capital equipment, uh, design and manufacturing as we do, um, and then end customers as well. And so we're very supportive um, of the act. We see many, many benefits. And I think honestly, the promise uh, of some of that future investment is already showing up in some of the announcements that are being made of uh, new semiconductor factories uh, in the United States. I think that's a very positive sign uh, related to this proposed legislation. And certainly from TEL's perspective, we just see this as uh, you know, certainly being a benefit to all and TEL is a part of that. Um, we want to participate. Uh, we see this as something that uh, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats um, in, in some way of, of saying it. Um, and that would extend also to um, the, uh, the National Semiconductor Technology Center as well. Um, as advanced development takes place, uh, we very much wish to participate in that uh, and partner and collaborate uh, and, of course, you know, receive some of the benefits that result from that. We do have some underlying concerns with some of uh, the amendments that have been proposed associated with legislation, I will say. Um, in particular, um, related to some potential restrictions on companies uh, associated with things like uh, buybacks, compensation related um, activities, and so on. You know, our view of the legislation is that this is about uh, investment. You know, this is not a, a bailout type legislation. And, and so we certainly would like to see it postured that way. Um, and then secondly, related to import export, um, Tell is a global company. Uh, we operate uh, real around the world, um, and we just simply feel that, that uh, multilateral approach to export is the right way to go. Uh, we would not like to see specific restrictions put in place. Um, you know, we feel that the current system has worked well, uh, and we should continue to pay attention to that. Um, I think it's quite clear that uh, we all want to be responsible. 
um, in terms of assuring that uh, the right technologies are preserved um, and not allowed to um, get to those that perhaps should not have them. Uh, but we, we feel that there's a, a correct way to do that, um, largely relying upon, frankly, the existing system that has been used uh, with good success. So that's, uh, that's our summary view. Mark, thank you so much. Ben, just any, any brief comments on supply chain bottlenecks, seeing any change, improvements, erosion? Yeah, I, I wish we could say that there's uh, improvements being seen. I would say not yet. Um, it continues to be a very challenging situation for us, um, even at uh, you know, any, any, even a, a small component level, raw material level. Uh, my hope is that through investments such as this legislation, that really the entire supply chain um, can be addressed. Um, we, we anticipate we'll continue to have significant challenges for at least the next 18 months, if not longer. Okay. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your perspective and uh, for being with us today. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Kurt Walter, uh, president of Polar Semiconductor. Kurt, welcome. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank you to all for joining today. Um, Polar is a semiconductor manufacturer located in Bloomington. Uh, we're right next to the mall. Matter of fact, we're close to Skywater. We'll hear from Skywater shortly. We actually have a shared history with Skywater. Many owners ago, each of us, um, we, we go back about 50 years uh, at that site. Uh, so we have quite a, a long legacy in, in Minnesota. Uh, we, um, we are owned currently now by uh, Sankin Electric and Allegro Microsystems. They're our owners and principal customers. Although we also have some uh, uh, defense contractor customers, Vicor, uh, that we also support. Uh, I would describe Allegro as a commercial and automotive company. And I'll talk about this more in a second, but we're very much uh, in the camp where we're not considered one of the state of the art semiconductor players, uh, like an Intel or a Samsung, that, that type of company. We're, we're very much a legacy uh, company that delivers older technology. Uh, we're in the power and uh, sensing application um, markets. And so we're very much interested in that aspect of the legislation about legacy fabs and, and how we can make the older fabs and some of the older technology nodes more competitive um, in the United States. Um, I'll, I'll mention this kind of as a sort of pride, but. Uh, in the automotive sector through Allegro Microsystems about five or 10 years ago, uh, I could safely say that just about every automobile driven in the United States had a chip manufactured in the Bloomington location. So, but unfortunately a lot of that has been eroded and moved offshore uh, just due to capacity and technology uh, challenges. So we're really looking at this uh, legislation to uh, improve the competitiveness and the ability to keep onshore manufacturing. And I know, and I, and I can't speak for Allegro specifically, they're now a publicly traded company. You can go look up Allegro Microsystems, but mm -hmm. we're, um, you know, we're very much in, in support of them and they're very much interested in keeping a lot of onshore manufacturing, uh, keeping uh, control of that supply chain uh, for their automotive customers. They are incredibly uh, uh, backed up right now as, you know, in, in terms of this, the supply chain discussion that you asked, Congressman, um, the, the backlog of orders we have is almost insurmountable. You know, they're talking usually weeks and months would be typical. They're talking years of backlog right now. So we don't see any end in sight in terms of the needed investment and growth that we have to do um, to, to continue to be, um, you know, supplying the, the industry with, with uh, chips. So... It's, it's, a, it's a critical situation and a real opportunity to, to invest in American companies to keep uh, growing uh, uh, effectively so that we can support these initiatives. Years of backlog. Yeah, literally, yeah. Astounding, astounding. The, the, the semiconductor uh, industry, people on the line obviously know that it has ups and downs and, and we're, in, mm -hmm. we're in this, I've been in the industry 30 years and this is as strong as an upswing as I've ever seen. And I think it's gonna completely swamp any downswing you know i i um i, I think we're going to be in this for you know this growth phase for for many years to come so you know it's an exciting time but it's, it's very difficult i hear you well thank you so much for being with us uh, today and sharing your thank perspective you.
Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Brad Ferguson, uh, Chief Government Affairs Officer of Skywater Technology, and who is also here with John Cooney, I believe. That's right. Thank you, Congressman. It's good to see you again. And thanks, good to see you, Brad. Thanks for convening this group to discuss the ongoing efforts to address the immense challenges that are facing those of us in the semiconductor industry. It's also great to see uh, some of my colleagues here in the Twin Cities uh, semiconductor ecosystem. So I'd like to start by recognizing your early engagement and commitment in making sure Congress acts to level the playing field, which has tilted America out of favor in chip manufacturing. So my name is Brad Ferguson. I've had the privilege of growing my career since graduation, all right here in the Twin Cities. And I currently serve as Chief Government Affairs Officer for Skywater Technology based here in Bloomington. Uh, with facilities in Florida and Indiana. Like what Kurt mentioned with Polar Semiconductor, we're, we're just right around the corner and, and do share some common heritage uh, dating back to control data. Uh, Skywater Technology is the sole US investor owned and US based pure play semiconductor foundry. Our diverse customer base includes the US government for aerospace and defense applications, as well as partners in the medical device, automotive communications, quantum computing and consumer products markets. As a leader in the development and production of feature rich nodes, Skywater falls directly in the category of, of a provider of chips that interestingly was recently identified by the Department of Commerce last week as it read out the results of its industry survey as its target for alleviating anticipated bottlenecks over the coming years. Put simply, the US government wants more of these chips produced domestically, and the chips legislation, USICA and America Competes Act, are bills originally envisioned to help companies like Skywater accelerate their expansion efforts here at home in response to US manufacturers continually being lured away and abroad with these same types of incentives offered in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. So thank you again, Representative Phillips. Uh, from my observation, your work and influence among your colleagues has helped us to get where we are today, and it's very exciting to see. Um, as far as the, the provisions of the America Competes Act, we also do have some concerns that, that could, uh, could be addressed. So as much as we all appreciate free markets as a balanced driver of growth and innovation, the fact is that Congress and the president are not able to control the global economy. This, this fact has played out in country after country over three decades now, where subsidies in Taiwan, Korea, and China have incubated and candidly catapulted these countries' domestic capabilities in semiconductor manufacturing to the forefront, with in some cases greater than a 40% subsidy on those uh, investments in their domestic capabilities. Due to this dynamic, we all recognize the only path forward is for government investment to get fabs built, outfitted with tools, qualified and competing for our country's share of the global demand for chips. The title of this bill is appropriately titled as the America Competes Act. It's, it's appropriate as the challenge in front of us is competition. Whether it's competition to recruit and retain companies, compete for talent, or compete for global market share, this bill should remain focused on its original mission to build the kinds of fabs that are building the kinds of chips needed and the ecosystems to keep these fabs running. The advanced nodes that TSMC will make in Arizona and that Intel has suggested they will make in Ohio are important given geopolitical realities in Asia, but what is needed are feature rich legacy nodes and alternatives to, to silicon. For example, gallium nitride, carbon nanotube transistors, as the, those applications are not only relevant today, but they are leading to technological advancements that will be relevant for decades to come. Chasing the end of Moore's law is an understandable endeavor, but in our opinion, not one that will solve America's challenges. As Skywater looks to the future, we recognize the importance of expanding our operations in Minnesota and at our other sites. So we hope to successfully compete for a grant administered by the Department of Commerce, prioritizing American-owned, American-based companies serving the needs identified through the rigorous market research conducted over the last year by the Secretary's Office and NIST 
with the help of industry specialists and other bureaus at the department. So efforts to expand the amount of money made available, uh, for example, uh, raising the cap from 3 billion to 6 billion per entity, expanding that uh, amount, amount of money made available to the four top companies like TSMC, Intel, Samsung, and Global Foundries will lessen the amount available to proven manufacturers outside of those, those big four companies who will drive the expansion of the semiconductor ecosystem domestically outside of uh, areas of concentration like New York, Texas, Ohio, and Arizona. Additionally, another provision, all of the companies who will be competing for grant funding will have access to private capital and low interest loans through the setting aside of $6 billion for a loan program administered by the Department of Commerce as, as a provision of the America Competes Act. This unfortunately has the effect of lowering the amount of grants available to compete against other countries while offering a funding scheme that is unlikely to be utilized. So we, we are very grateful for the opportunity to discuss this bill with you today and hope that uh, after passage, you're appointed to the conference committee to help shape this legislation, which ultimately could lead to increased US share of global manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. I, I appreciate it. And uh, is, is, does John want to make any remarks? I don't know if he's with you. Today. No, I, I would like to oh, very okay. much just uh, say thank you uh, for, for your engagement and, and leadership and bringing us together in, in such a timely manner. But I'm um, defer my comments to Brad, not least of which because I've got a very vocal four-year-old in the other room. So well, I was going to say, maybe uh, <laughs> some, of the, some of the most insightful comments I hear are from four-year-olds. So <laughs> anyway, good, good to see you both, Brad and John. Thank you uh, for being Thank with you. us and for investing in Minnesota, of course. Uh, next, I want to welcome Dave Samsel, who's the VP of uh, Corporate Development, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary at Digi International. Uh, welcome, Dave. You there, Dave? Sorry, I had to mute myself. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not going to be on video today. I'm recovering uh, from some surgery, so I'll oh, spare you okay, all my okay. photo. But uh, no, I'm, I'm doing well and uh, have a clean bill of health. But uh, good. I'll just uh, stay off the video today. Um, okay. <clears throat> Digi is a customer. Uh, we buy chips from, uh, from a number of uh, providers and and uh, we make uh, modules and box-based products, uh, but a lot of our modules end up going into the uh, products of various OEMs to provide crucial connectivity for, for Internet of Things uh, applications. Um, <clears throat> we are broadly uh, supportive of the act. We, we view it as uh, important. Um, so many sources of supply these days are uh, single threaded and are, are often based outside the United States. So broadly, we're very supportive of anything that promotes uh, manufacturing at home and uh, that broadly um, uh, increases the capabilities of, of manufacturing and sources of supply here in the United States, be it through uh, US based manufacturers or parties who want to build uh, you know, facilities here. So we're, we're broadly supportive of the act. Um, <clears throat> relative to your questions on the supply chain, I think we would hit upon uh, the same types of themes that, that you've heard from some of the semiconductor providers. We're seeing enormous um, demand um, for our products that incorporate these uh, chips um, as more and more people want to uh, conduct Internet of Things applications. Um, and um, we, we see that as a trend that's going to continue for many years. We have a lot of backlog as well right now. Um, a lot of that is just driven by an inability to get um, consistent supply from uh, the foundries that we have to rely upon for our products. Um, and we view this act as a a long-term solution to to help ease some of those uh, pressures and provide more potential uh, sources of, of supply. Um, and relative to your question on are we seeing improvements, um, we, we are seeing some improvements, but uh, you know we we recently had a conference call 
where we were discussing, hey, if we were at DEF CON 5 before, we might be at you know, DEF CON 4.5 right now. So we are seeing some improvements, um, we believe, relative to our own business. Um, we may see more improvement uh, quicker than, than some of the other commenters have, have acknowledged, but it is and remains a very, very fluid uh, situation and a, and a difficult one on the supply chain side. Okay, thank you, David. And any um, any elements of the America Competes Act that, uh, from Digi's perspective, would like to see enhanced or changed or modified uh, that come to mind? I, I think from our perspective, you know, I appreciate the perspective that you're hearing from some of the manufacturers. I think from our perspective, um, we're supportive of anything that brings supply uh, into the United States, regardless of of, of the source. So we may be more supportive of some of the things that others are, are pointing to as potential drawbacks, um, okay. just from, you know, from our perspective. I appreciate that. Well, a uh, speedy recovery to you and uh, Dave, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Brendan Peter, who's the head of US government relations of Seagate Technology. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Congressman. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having us and thanks for coordinating this. Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of similar commentary from my colleagues. Um, much like them, we also have an a, a origination via control gate corporation in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, we started in our Bloomington site there in 1961. Um, wow. And we have two campuses in Minnesota. Um, one in Bloomington, one in Shakopee, and we're in the process actually of moving the Shakopee site, all of those people and assets into our Bloomington site. It's about a 730,000 square foot manufacturing facility with about 270,000 square feet of clean rooms. Um, and, you know, Seagate is a ubiquitous company that makes technology that the world relies on every day. Um, we're the world's largest leading data storage manufacturer, and we're a vertically integrated manufacturing organization. We manufacture from scratch more than 90% of all of the components that go inside our storage devices around the world. And we have seven major manufacturing sites around the country. The most sophisticated manufacturing we do anywhere in the world is done in two places, um, in Bloomington and in um, Northern Ireland. And what we make in Bloomington are recording heads that are embedded in disk drives that do the read-write capability on all digital storage media. And so, um, you know, our process is virtually identical to semiconductor manufacturing. What comes out of the end of it, however, is not a semiconductor, but it's a magnetized read-write head that uses many of the same raw materials. It uses virtually all of the same manufacturing photolithography equipment as we move through our manufacturing process. And much like traditional semiconductors is something that is facing massive demand and supply challenges. Um, there are only five factories in the world that make what we make in Minnesota. And of our global supply, we are able to produce about 30% of the global capacity of recording heads wow. that we supply to the market. We make and ship about a billion of them a year. And the other 70% is done in, in Northern Ireland. And so um, much like you know, broad demand for semiconductor growth, Everything that happens everywhere in the world, every transaction, every bit and byte of information is stored on a data storage medium. And about 40% of the world's data sits on Seagate storage media. And so we are facing a multitude of challenges, both in terms of raw materials availability, um, availability of that same photolithography and machining equipment that we need to build and ramp capacity inside of our operations in the United States and in Northern Ireland, as well as downstream impacts of our own purchase and integration of core semiconductors into our data storage devices. And so we're kind of being hit on three different mechanisms and, and much mm -hmm. like 
you know, a traditional semiconductor manufacturing process, what we are producing in Bloomington are eight inch wafers out of each eight, out of each wafer, we produce about a hundred thousand recording heads. So each of these is smaller than a grain of rice. And it's a six to nine month process that involves 1600 manufacturing steps in Minnesota. And really I would say, you know, from our perspective, um, the world's creation and demand for greater data storage and the consumption and movement of data is expanding exponentially year over year. And, you know, one of our big messages is while we are not a traditional semiconductor company, the ubiquity of our technology supports every industry and every transaction in the world. And part of our desire is to see that technology platforms that have very much similar profiles and reliance on the same raw materials, the same machining equipment that are also having very significant capacity challenges are also things that are likely able to potentially take advantage of some of the potential opportunities through the Semiconductor Chips Act and Competes Act funding. Um, you know, we very much want to scale our operations in Minnesota. We have about 2,500 people in the state right now, and we very much would like to continue to rebalance that demand. But we're waiting at least 12 to 18 months for new machining equipment, which are the same ones that Intel, TSMC, and everybody are buying mm -hmm. for their semiconductor processes. And we're also having very significant problems with raw materials. We incorporate about 80 elements of the periodic table into our manufacturing wow. processes. And one thing that I just highlight, which is well beyond baseline chips, but you know, phosphorus as a raw material in particular, which is important in all of these manufacturing processes, you know, about 90% of the world's smelters are in China for phosphorus, and the Chinese mm -hmm. government has really been clamping down on supply. So, you know, uh, we're wholly supportive. Um, we very much want to be involved, um, you know, the Commerce Department's RFI on CHIPS Act and Yusika funding that came out this week, I think points to you know, some definitional issues they would like some help on relative to the core definition of semiconductors. We would like okay. to see that a, a bit more broadly expanded. Um, and we would like to see also, I think, a, a, a better appreciation, which I think is kind of similar to what our colleagues from Skywater and others have mentioned, that, you know, the types of investments in terms of payoff and size are not all in the five to six billion dollar range. Um, there are a lot of smaller investments that, from our perspective, would enable us to dramatically expand our production capability in Minnesota to rebalance what we're supplying in terms of those one billion pieces that we're manufacturing in those sites today. And right now, we're forecasting that we're going to run out of capacity to be able to meet the growing market demand in another 16 months or so based on availability wow. of equipment. And so there are a lot of parallel supply chains and industries that are equally ubiquitous and equally critical that use exactly the same manufacturing processes. And our hope and desire is that we can work with you and others to continue to educate folks about the really novel, amazing manufacturing that companies like ours are doing in the state of Minnesota and evangelizing for greater growth of those investments here. So we're excited. We're, we're going to be investing in Minnesota no matter what. We have to. Um, but right now we're, you know, like a lot of companies, continuing to look at different levers and opportunities. And this movement towards Chip Act funding is really incredible. And we're hoping to be a part of it as we move forward. So thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Brandon. And, and just to reiterate to all of you, uh, uh, you're sharing some perspective, of course, verbally in, on this call, but uh, please uh, share with my team anything uh, in writing that we can uh, uh, consolidate and then share with uh, those in, on both sides of the aisle, frankly, uh, and most importantly, those who will be serving on a conference committee uh, to get this across the finish line. Uh, so the more detail, specificity you can provide to us, uh, the more uh, we can uh, move it. So thank you. And thank you, Brendan. 
Uh, now, uh, please introduce Gabriella Spence and Michael Morton uh, from Medical Alley. Congressman, wonderful to see you as always. Uh, thank you for convening this diverse group. Uh, I'm Gabriella Spence, Medical Alley Association's Federal Policy and Advocacy Manager. And um, I'm gonna start just uh, with a quick intro to the association, and then I will give Michael a little intro because he's a new face for us. And it's his first time attending uh, one of these roundtables. So Medical Alley Association, for those of you who aren't familiar, represents the central nervous system of the most diverse and influential healthcare community in the world. Our over 600 member companies represent the full continuum of care from digital health, biotech, and medical device to payers, providers, startups, and Fortune 500s. And our membership, our members and leadership are committed to transforming the future of healthcare, which is why we're particularly excited about this conversation. You know, there's plenty of things to be excited about in this bill. Um, a couple of them, and of course, you know, it's a giant bill, so naturally there are a few concerns as well. Um, I think some of the elements we'd like to flag for you today are uh, also love a good section by section, even if it is uh, well into 20 pages long. Um, we appreciate the investment in, um, in chips manufacturing here in the US. I did note, and I think our members would feel remiss if I didn't mention this, um, there's not an emphasis on or mention of healthcare. Um, I don't think that's necessarily needed. And Congressman, you've always been a champion of the healthcare industry. So I'm mostly just noting that for the record. I know that there's um, applications and uh, um, you know, even though in the bill, it mentions production of automobiles, consumer electronics and defense, that doesn't necessarily require healthcare to be mentioned, but I'll leave it there. Um, okay. Definitely excited about the strengthening of supply chains. I will echo similar comments. Many of our diverse healthcare companies have not seen any alleviation, and that's from start to finish. That's not just in raw materials and manufacturing overseas. That's trying to get our uh, or their products off of the ports in the U.S. and all the way here to Minnesota or from Minnesota to other locations in the United States. Um, so very eager for any alleviation that can be brought. Um, definitely a little bit of concern over what elements we really can um, bring, what elements of manufacturing we can bring back, um, particular emphasis on the natural resources elements. And I think, again, many of the people on the call noted we're a global economy for a reason. Um, so being able to balance that concept of bringing elements back to America and kind of bolstering that uh, made in America sense, but also acknowledging there are elements that can't be found or reproduced here in the US uh, and just striking that balance. I, I did also want to flag, um, there's a specific quote in section C under Committee on Energy and Commerce. Um, the, okay. the sentence is relocate, and I will send this to your staff as well, okay. um, I should okay. have in Thank advance, you. but uh, it's been a busy couple of days. Um, <laughs> relocate a manufacturing facility out of countries of concern, and, and forgive me, I'm not sure if it mentioned this in the bill, but I'd be curious as to how those are, how countries of concern is being defined. Um, Okay. I'll, it, yeah, I think uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then the other item I'm really excited about was the Division I Committee on Judiciary supporting uh, the creation of W visas, so W one, two, and three for entrepreneurs, their employees, and their families. This is a fantastic investment in the startup ecosystem and would help support increasing our workforce, new business formation, and obviously bringing new technology and diversity into the ecosystem. Um, so again, lots to be excited about, um, just flagging a couple of concerns of note for you there, but I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Michael, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce him. Michael Morton is our new interim senior leader for policy and advocacy. He has a rich background in regulatory affairs and public policy, and I'm very pleased he can join us today. So Michael, I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you Thanks very you much. Me. Yes, thank you, Gabriella, and uh, certainly thank you, Congressman uh, Phillips. Uh, this is certainly a broad bill. There's an awful lot to uh, like in this bill. 
The manufacturer members of Medical Alley are certainly impacted by the supply chain crisis uh, that, uh, uh, that we're in right now. As Gabriella mentioned, we, we do not see healthcare called out. And for those of you manufacturers on this call, you know that uh, medical quality components differ from say automotive or electronic uh, entertainment whatnot. They're usually done under a GNP or some sort of a quality system. So we may want to look at having some sort of recognition of that. I want to go back to what Brad had mentioned a minute ago about uh, subsidies uh, in some of our ally uh, countries like Taiwan and Korea. I'll give a quick personal example that a friend of mine, an American citizen, Korean American, uh, uh, living in Korea, is in the business of assisting uh, medical technology to transfer to the United States, either in manufacturing or just uh, uh, to, um, to enter the market. Uh, he's working with a very promising device, very promising company. Uh, he was making arrangements to facilitate that entry into the U.S. market. The Korean-based company opted to go with all Korean, um, if you will, uh, assistance in entering the U.S. market, and they've been a total failure because they're, they're, not, they're not able to understand what it takes to jump the regulatory hurdles and, and other things. So in a case like this, it's a no-win for anyone. And, and I think there's, a, there's an example where um, uh, subsidies can uh, get in the way. And let me just mention briefly that I think we are quite impressed with uh, Division B on research and innovation. Uh, very pleased with the emphasis on STEM, uh, 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 STEM education. Uh, I'm pleased in uh, uh, what I'm reading about support of the Regional Innovation Act. I happen to be involved also in incubators that are being developed in Oklahoma and in Nebraska. I'm liking what I see there, and I really hope to see more of, uh, of uh, this activity in Minnesota. And finally, I'm pleased to see the National Institute for Standards uh, called out. They are a big help um, in innovation uh, and they have a very aging campus. So I like, I like the support there. So thank you again, Congressman. Michael, thank you for a, a great overview. And uh, as you all know, this is a 2,912 page measure. Uh, I, it is, clearly not going to pass in its existing form, in my estimation. It's going to take some more negotiation, uh, some votes, of course, and conferencing. But uh, I do believe there is bipartisan, uh, uh, bipartisan mandate, if you will, to uh, make some of these critical investments and ensure that we are competitive. And your feedback today uh, is very meaningful to me personally uh, and will be shared with all of those uh, uh, who will be at the table. Uh, you know, my intention, of course, is uh, on a micro level is to ensure the Twin Cities area in Minnesota more broadly uh, can build uh, on its existing investments and become even a, a more important international hub uh, of the work that all of you are doing. So uh, since we have a few extra minutes, uh, and I do hope you all share uh, any detail you want with my team and me uh, offline, uh, if anybody wants to speak to other challenges that you're facing, uh, the labor market, uh, other inflationary challenges, supply chain challenges, uh, anything that you want to make me aware of, because uh, this is part of a broader question of how do we uh, become more competitive uh, in Minnesota, uh, attract some of the great uh, entrepreneurs in the country and around the world, ensure that we have a, uh, a labor uh, pool uh, that is well-trained and prepared to do the work, uh, high-tech work that so many of you are engaged in. So uh, if anybody wants to speak to other areas of concern uh, that I can be a resource and advocate for, 
Uh, I'm all ears. Congressman, I'll start. This is Mark. Um, yeah, Mark. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly the, the issue that you highlighted in terms of uh, talent and workforce development is a, uh, is a critical one. Um, you know, as we all are continuing to grow, that certainly requires, uh, you know, having uh, teammates and team members with the requisite skills um, appropriate to our industry. And, and I think that is a broad spectrum. So often we think about perhaps the, the higher end technical skills um, and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I think we're well positioned, you know, here in the in the Twin Cities uh, with okay. University of Minnesota system and so on. Yeah. But but when we talk about really the manufacturing skills, um, assembly, test technician, mm-hmm. um, you know, even um, things like machining type skills, I think that frankly there's a dearth uh, of those types of talents. One of the yeah. things that we have been um, doing is working with institutions like Dunwoody, uh, Hennepin Tech. Uh, the um, National Institute for Innovation and Technology. I, I, I know that uh, Skywalk has been doing the same in terms of announcing their apprenticeship program. We've been looking at the need to do the same uh, and also starting to have discussions even at the high school level to, to identify those individuals who want to participate uh, in that way. So I think we need to continue to promote the high tech sector and all that we do, but it doesn't just mean you need to go get a four-year degree or a master's or a PhD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and developing and investing at that level, I think, is, is going to be very, very critical for all of us. And I'm glad you bring that oh. up, Mark. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, oh, I was going to say, sorry, this is Kurt. I was going to yeah, second, that, second that wholeheartedly. The the backbone of our facility is really at the technician level. I mean, every every position mm-hmm. is important, of course, but the, the uh, technicians that work on the line, fix the machines, work in the facility, um, electricians and, and vacuum specialists, you know, you, you name it. That's, that's really what makes the, the facility run. And that's our biggest challenge is hiring really good people. That's so I, I fully support those comments that Mark made. Yeah, thank you both Mark and Kurt. And I, and I want to thank all, I, many of your enterprises are making those investments and uh, creating programs, um, you know, with some of the uh, community colleges in town. And I, I really celebrate that and want to emulate those best practices of course, in Minnesota, around the country. Anybody else want to uh, comment on that? This is Brendan. I would just also yeah, Brendan, sure. wholeheartedly agree with that. I think in a very similar vein, you know, I mean, of, of the 2,500 people that we have in Minnesota, you know, probably more than a thousand are engineers, mm-hmm. you know, like 300 or so have PhDs, mm-hmm. but the vast bulk of folks in a very similar way are equipment technicians and line operators. And so, you know, yeah. we, you know, Minnesota is both a very significant R&D and a production facility for us. And so mm-hmm. similar to what other folks have identified, we need folks at every level of education capability. And I think the biggest challenge most large enterprises face is not just on the, the raw availability of talent, but mm-hmm. obviously the timelines to mm-hmm. ensure that you can hire, train, and keep really good people because, you know, these are long-standing training requirements. They're very Mm -hmm. specific, sophisticated manufacturing jobs as well. And so we're all on the lookout for that constantly. And it's definitely, um, you know, something that we all need to do more to attract additional good people to our enterprises at all levels. So I'm glad. Yeah, you thank you, that. Brendan, too. Yeah, you know, I, I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, between the bipartisan infrastructure bill for which I voted, we recently passed uh, this initiative, which clearly I hope uh, will pass, needs to pass in some way, shape or form. Uh, we're making massive uh, transformational investments in, in our country and in our future. Uh, but if we don't match that with a labor pool that's ready to uh, take that ball and run with it, uh, we're going to be in trouble. And I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that uh, in no small way, it's the software complementing the hardware here, uh, the human software, if you will, uh, that is going to be so important. So I, I salute those efforts and will continue to spend a lot of my time and energies on building those partnerships and um, uh, advocating as well. Any other, any other comments uh, relative to, you know, I guess, digging down just a little bit deeper, you know, is there anything that this bill doesn't address right now uh, that you would like to see uh, policymakers consider, uh, and it's fair. Anything you wish to share is fair game. If not, I'm going to assume the bill is just perfect. 
<laughs> well, Congressman, I, I, I'd suggest just two things to point out that I think are, um, you know, interesting components of broader competitiveness. Um, and, you know, obviously in the in the SICA bill, there is a, uh, a significant electronic frontiers title that's focused yeah. on next generation research and development. And so ensuring that the National Science Foundation has access to that, you know, as as we have looked at those 10 categories of innovation that are called out there, we're very much involved in eight out of the 10. And so accelerating that both at the academic level and at the industry level is something that's really, really important. I think one other thing that we would just you know stress is one of the things that the US government, I think, um, and, and our CEO in particular has a particular passion about this is, you know, given we have a lot of employees whose PhDs were funded by NSF. And as we think about how to democratize access to that data, you know, we fund a lot of things and we should be thinking about a national research computing resource that can make more data available to additional researchers that has been funded by the US government. And so that's a very kind of technical democratization thing. But as we think about AI and using blockchain to help trusted researchers check data sets out from people that have been funded by government agencies. Yeah, I think our CEO likes to talk all the time that when you know he, he got his PhD 30 plus years ago, um, part of his research was funded by NSF. And he could guarantee you that if he could give researchers new access to the information that he collected 30 years ago, there would be vastly different insights generated. And so hmm. we are doing some things kind of with AI infrastructure and supercomputing, but as we fund a lot of things, I think looking at better ways to leverage those investments for broader public good and democratization of the data that's derived from the that research, I think is something that is really, that would be a foundational step in our view to continuing to accelerate cross industry and across the country, our ability to continue to learn new insights from data that's generated through all of our varying research and development um, experiments and particularly those that are funded by public dollars. I appreciate that, yeah, great point, wonderful. Uh, and I'm taking uh, notes as well as my team. And again, I hope that when you do any follow-up with, uh, with us, I hope you will uh, include that as well. Anybody else? Uh, elements? Yeah. Congressman, yeah, that, uh, wanted just to mm -hmm. flag. Um, yeah, sorry, just really quick, Brad. I know you just un unmuted as well. Um, just wanted to flag that initiative under the Department of Commerce to create a supply chain. I don't remember exact verbiage for it, but um, I, I didn't note any particular reporting requirements. I'm sure that's going to be fleshed out, but I do just want to flag that for you. I know that the White House had the supply chain task force, and right. I think just given the severity of the crisis and how long it is continuing um, and affecting many of our medical device members and therefore the hospitals and the doctors sure. and ultimately the patients, um, I would want to ensure that there is some sort of public reporting and that there's some sort of um, opportunity for public input and some actionable mm -hmm. steps, because I did note that there were research opportunities uh, but it often does stop there and they're not brought to, uh, for lack of a better term, commercialization. So wanted to flag that for okay. your consideration. Thank you, Gabriella. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. First. Yeah, I, in, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure necessarily if, if the act goes into effect, um, the impacts that it has on the medical device industry in the, you know, more immediate future. This is the same, so by the way, but I would yeah, Dave. Mm -hmm. echo something that, that Gabriella said earlier, which is, <clears throat> you know, our customers that that rely upon our mo you know uh, modules, they they run the gauntlet, and they are medical device companies. They are companies that are interested in monitoring and managing infrastructure. Uh, companies, even in the retail space, that need to monitor or manage. Uh, their infrastructure, be it monitoring temperature or other environmental conditions. Um, and it, I think it's really important the government not lose sight of that. I think there's tr been tremendous focus on the automobile industry and things that are, you know, inherent to <clears throat> national security, et cetera. But th these chips increasingly are, are crucial 
in other industries. Um, and, and particularly, I think it's fair for the medical device industry to, to raise their hand and note that, that this supply shortage for them um, directly impacts lives. Um, and I think we've potentially lost a little bit of sight of that just for whatever reason, be it, you know, there's powerful lobbying influences elsewhere or whatnot, but um, increasingly our customers run a very broad spectrum across many industries. And that's a trend that's just going to continue, I believe, into the long-term future. You know, thanks for calling attention to that, Dave. I, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Anybody else before? Yeah, uh, did I hear someone? Yeah, uh, Congressman, if I may. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so just uh, just to very briefly uh, echo a few things because I know we're running out of time. The supply chain concerns have been a uh, a theme that uh, Department of Commerce has been looking at very closely, and I think yeah. that's a very important element. Also, uh, demand uh, visibility up up the stream as well as downstream, I think is important to address. Workforce development is a very big deal. Uh, I won't uh, reiterate what has already been said, but we are aggressively ramping our efforts to uh, develop talent and secure talent, both uh, apprenticeships, internships. Uh, there's another point that, uh, that Brendan mentioned about uh, democratizing access to technology. We at Skywater have been working with Google on an open source effort for uh, chip design IP that is a way to uh, catapult the industry forward in terms of access by lowering barriers, but it's also a workforce development tie-in. And so we've been advising the De uh, Department of Commerce on that, and we hope that, that something comes of that. If inflation is a big deal, uh, obviously uh, is impacting all of us, including shipping costs. Oddly, even delivery drivers for liquid gas products is, is a constraint for us. And I, I don't know others who use liquid nitrogen uh, have uh, probably had similar impacts. The last point I'll leave you with is, is the FABS Act is a very interesting mm -hmm. vehicle for us. The uh, investment tax credit could go a long ways towards uh, uh, restoring America's leadership in this very important industry. Thank you, Congressman. Hey, thank you very much, Brad. Um, and duly noted to all of you, I, I really wanna thank you all for uh, taking your time uh, today. Uh, and of course, I have visited Tokyo Electron and Skywater myself. I hope to be uh, in the rest of your facilities sometime in the near future. Uh, much of what I've learned from those visits, uh, I have shared uh, here in Washington, and um, much of it has made its way into this very measure. And uh, I'm going to do anything I can to get it over the finish line. And this is a perfect example of of how a little bit of listening can go a long way. So uh, please know that our lines are always open uh, and my team is standing by to, to uh, hear any more concerns you might have, ideas. Uh, and uh, I will be an advocate for all of you and for Minnesotans uh, and to return manufacturing uh, of such importance uh, back to the United States. So, uh, so I wish you all well, keep the faith, keep in touch. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon and stay healthy. Uh, and many thanks for your time today. Uh, with that, uh, I don't know if we have any members of the media on. Uh, if so, and anybody has a question, by all means, uh, feel free to uh, raise your virtual hand. All right, well, seeing none, have good days, everybody. Thank you again for joining us uh, and we'll be in touch. And uh, uh, I'm gonna get to work beginning this afternoon, pushing this across the finish line. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Time, Thank you, Congressman. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.